Hey, yo, welcome back to Reddit The Wire. Well, the Breeders' Cup is fast approaching, so let's start looking at the divisions. Today, we're going to take a look at the Juvenile Turf Sprint. So, let's get a look at it. So, this is the Juvenile Turf Sprint, and of course, we don't know what the field consists of yet, as we don't know about the, uh, the international horses and who's coming over, or the Americans for that matter. Uh, but uh, this is the list of prospective candidates I've got from the Breeders' Cup website. Uh, Bright Work I've put an asterisk by because they do list uh, Bright Work as a potential candidate for the race. But since he's been, she's been running on dirt for the for her whole career so far, uh, she may end up elsewhere. So we'll cover her uh, at another time in another uh, division. So I've grouped these by uh, the prep races that they've been in. So if we have multiple entrants in a prep race, uh, we'll cover all of them, and uh, then we'll look at the race. So the first one we look at is Shards, and it's owned by Crownsway Racing and a very underrated trainer in Kelsey Danner. Uh, she does know how to get them ready, so don't overlook this one. Uh, in the Indian Summer Stakes had a really nice third, I thought, and uh, was a little unlucky. Uh, but uh, I think this one is perhaps a comer. Then we got Committee of One, who actually won what was a really thrilling race to watch, a great duel uh, down the stretch. Um, and it's owned by uh, uh, Kirk Robeson and his wife. And uh, Steve Asperson's really been uh, inserting himself into turf sprints this year. He was very prominent at Saratoga and uh, looks like he's here to stay. And you got Christian Torres, who's a uh, really uh, another up-and-coming rider. And then in the duel on amidst waves, uh, it was just a hair short, but uh, it looks like a really good one for George Weaver, who has basically become the king of turf sprints. He's, I think he's unseating Wesley Ward. He was phenomenal at Saratoga with turf sprints and shouldn't be overlooked. So those last three were all in the Indian Summer Stakes, recently run at Keeneland. Uh, and uh, Shards is in hole number one, amidst waves in number two, and Committee of One in number six. So let's see how they did. They're off in the Indian summer, presented by Keeneland Select. You see, they've got all, all three of them got off in pretty good order. Uh, all lingering in mid-pack. With shards a little bit at the rear. Pretty strong outfield. It mid waves looks a little keen. Pretty quick on the front end. You see right here, in the stretch of shards, saving all the ground, and Mitch Waves is having some traffic trouble, trying to get through that wall. And Shards kind of ran into it a little bit as well. You see Shards has tons of force. Just can't get through. Committee of One kind of took advantage of their traffic issues to get up and just got the head bob in a really nice race. But I thought all three of them acquitted themselves pretty well. And uh, of the three, I think Shards looked like the best to me. But we'll just have to see. The next three we're going to look at are all from California, so we really want to pay attention to them because more often than not, in the Breeders' Cup, when it's run out west, the California horses do surprise. So these are ones to pay attention to. First one is Dark Vintage, and uh, while he is Irish uh, uh, from origin, he's got all American breeding and uh, trained by Peter Yurton, who's just been red hot at Santa Anita. Uh, Barn is just running on full cylinders, and uh, he is... Uh, one to definitely watch in these bigger events. And, of course, with Juan Hernandez aboard, who's the top jockey in California, uh, we really have to pay attention to this one. Had a pretty good second in the speakeasy, uh, though we did have uh, some aid, and we'll take a look at that. Uh, April Vintage is another one from uh, the West, and uh, trained by Peter Miller, who's uh, great at sprints. Uh, Antonio Frisu, an up-and-coming rider, to be sure. So those California jockeys, uh, you know, I've seen it before that uh, when uh, you have a lot of invaders, uh, they want to uh, beat their chest a little bit. So uh, I think they'll be wanting to assert themselves. And this one had a had an okay third in the in the speakeasy, and then we have the winner Slider, who really looked uh, pretty classy 
uh, John Sadler trains and Hector Berrios. While I'm not keen on him, as you've heard me say before, in the uh, the downhill turf course, he does do very well uh, on the flat. And uh, this race will be run that way, so uh, he's one to look out for as well. So now we're going to look at the Speakeasy Stakes, which, was a, as you can see, was run at Santa Anita. And uh, Dark Vintage is in the one hole on the rail. Slider's right next to him in number two. And then April Vintage is out on the end in number ten. So let's see how, how it went. They're in the gate. And they're off in the we see Slider broke away Slider exceptionally well, right up there, as well as April Vintage. And Dark Vintage, uh, great name by the way, <laughs> is uh, staying in the back there. And we see Slider right up to the lead. Around the turn, and it is Slider in charge, leading three quarters of a length and Mysticism in second. It's two more lengths back to Bear River, moving up on the outside third. At the rail, Dark Vintage, Lord Prancelot is wide, then Tranch. See, Dark the Vintage took track. advantage of them and kind of blowing the, the turn the there, and he's had, he uh, saved all the ground and is right, sitting right there. Hey, April Vintage, uh, kind of moving along, but uh, he's sucking up for a third more than anything else. I just really didn't look like he was uh, any match for the top two. Uh, Slider definitely looks uh, pretty classy, but uh, a little disappointing, I think, from Dark Vintage, but perhaps he's capable uh, of being a contender. We'll just have to see. Our next grouping starts with Crown Imperial, and he's trained by John Ortiz, who is not to be underestimated. He's a sneaky good trainer. Uh, and you got Ricardo Santana aboard. This one's raced quite a bit. Uh, you can see he's got 408000 in earnings. Uh, in six starts. Uh, he did win the untappable stakes, but they also ran him in the Jessamine, which lends me to believe that perhaps they're going to try two turns with him in the uh, juvenile Philly, uh, juvenile turf. So we'll just have to see about that. Hidden Class uh, is trained by Joe Sharp, and, and I think this one's a late runner, and he's got just the right rider for him in Joel Rosario. As we know, Joe L likes to drop anchor, and uh, bring him from the rear, and that's a that's an ideal situation for this one. Uh, I, he ran a pretty good fourth in the untappable. I uh, would probably have to take another leap forward, but uh, anyway, he's got the right rider for him. So let's take a look at the untappable stakes. Okay, so this is the untappable, and we do know it's at Kentucky Downs, and what happens at Kentucky Downs stays at Kentucky Downs, as we know. So it's not always the greatest track to evaluate a horse's talent because it is very unique. Uh, from other American tracks, but uh, Hidden Class is in the 6th hole, and Crown Imperial is in the 12th hole. So it's got that big turn as it's pear-shaped, so the majority of this race is, is run on a turn, and I think that's what makes it different uh, from other tracks, but uh, let's see what happened here. Off in the Pepsi Untappable You see, stage. they all got off pretty well. And Candy Girl is sent out of there quickly with Song of Norway. These and those two, two were anxious right the off the bat, so a, a, a duel ensued, and them. that often happens. Now, granted, this was six and a half furlongs, so uh, being by Sweet Catherine Rose to the pretty outside, long uh, for a turf like sprint, especially on the rail. And there's Hidden Class getting dropped back and saving all the ground on the turn. Back to Judy Elaine to the outside. Being followed by Crown, Crown Imperial, Imperial did as well. He, he was, uh, they saved a lot of ground. I think it helped them later, both of them towards the rear. That's, that's, that's flying for two year olds, especially. Rolling here on the front end. Two lengths ahead of Copper, I'm running in third. Who's coming you see both wide. of them, Hidden Class After and Crown that, Imperial, kind of taking the same route. Both staying right along the rail and saving ground. Sweet Catherine Rose. They're into the stretch, a quarter of a mile and to go Crown here. Imperial was and able to work out a trip. Out a hidden class, uh, hold off the I thought, rallied Another very well, closed well, but, but uh, it was, you know, was kind of so like the Derby this year with Sweet Mage and uh, Angel of Empire. And hidden class was just a little too. farther behind and, and uh, consequently wasn't able to get up, but ran a solid race, I thought. 
Imperial. And you see Crown Imperial has got a nice, uh, over a nice win. Rum. And then came Buttercream Babe and Hidden Class. No Name Mets uh, made a, made some noise early on, particularly since they uh, sent him, George Weaver sent him over to Royal Ascot, uh, where he didn't uh, didn't fare terribly well. But um, you know we we can't hold that against him too much. Uh, that's a uh, it was a really top class field he ran in in the Norfolk, I believe, uh, but just really wasn't able to uh, wasn't his best day. Let's just say that. But being trained by George Weaver who really seems to have uh, developed a knack for these turf sprints. Uh, he did great at Saratoga with it. Um, I don't think we want to underestimate him. So uh, his race, uh, most recent one, was the Rosie Stakes at Colonial Downs. So let's take a look at it. So this is Rosie Stakes, and it was run at Colonial Downs. No Name Mets is in the five hole. Okay. And the race is on in the Rosie Stakes. Good start for the favorite. You no see, Name no Mets, name Mets right broke the like really Smash sharply. And and no uh, the inside. Here's King no Coffee. disguising his intent. Or, no <laughs> for sure, the right to the lead. Crew rallies up from the far outside. Tupi was out in fifth. Then comes Gon Elvis, who's sixth. A.G. Diamond's back seventh. Meet Nero starting to back up his eighth. Three more back to Woodcourt. It comes at midnight and Ruddy Buddy. No name she's has getting some pressure there early King on, but to square off as they, they know, we'll turn. see. It's Doopy probably not going to bother him a whole lot. They 21 and 2. They drilled that opening quarter mile. King Conti That's pretty up on quick. the outside of No Name Eds. Toopy just looms in behind. Going to swing out three wide for the drive. In behind, A Recruit's going to take down toward the inside. Then comes Sebastian Run. They turn to the top of the stretch. No Name Eds just in front. Trying to put away King Conti, but a fresh challenge in Toopy on the he outside. Changed leads right no Name Eds comes to the furlong pole. Length and a half to the good. Toopy is second. Down the outside, A Recruit runs Sebastian. Trying to run on with that midnight. But a final 16 to go, and No Name Eds is pulling clear. you got to question the quality no of this field a little now, bit, but still, he did what good horses is supposed to do. He won decisively. And, uh, you know, they even geared him down a little bit at the end, so pretty impressive. Crimson Advocate is another one that chipped over to Royal Ascot, uh, for, trained by George Weaver, and you got Johnny V aboard. Um, those type of connections may have, you know, <laughs> dictate that you take this one seriously. Here's the problem, though. This one hasn't run since Royal Ascot, and I have to say, the Royal Palm Juvenile, prior to that, I wasn't overly impressed with Crimson Advocate because I don't think I uh, ran against a whole lot. But uh, he proved me wrong in the, uh, the Queen Mary, so let's see how that one shaped up. So this is the Queen Mary from Royal Ascot, and note that there are three gates and uh, that gives you an idea how many horses were in this race. Uh, Crimson Advocate is down on the rail in the red silks. You see him there, he broke up. Not a great break, but it wasn't bad either. And uh, just stays right along the rail. And of course, it is a straightaway, but uh, look, the cavalry is coming here. I mean, that is a monster field. And as you see, often they do that, they'll split off into couple of different groups to stay off the middle and you see crimson advocate over there on the right just completely uncontested and uh see some undulations too that's another thing we don't see too much of except like a kentucky downs but and you see, he's he is equal to the task. I mean, he's uh, and that's a pretty good field he's going with too. He's, you see that William Haggis runner coming right up on his tail, and he was able to just hang on. But that that's a pretty good effort against uh, uh, what you have to consider a top class field, especially when you have that many. Yeah, you see, just able to hang on right by the head bob. Pretty wild. Hedwig is uh, owned by the Mighty Godolphin Stables and trained by Owen Hardy. James Graham's the jockey. Uh, this one got a pretty good second in his second start at Kentucky Downs in the Juvenile Sprint Stakes. So I'd have to say that that's a, uh, uh, that, that, demonstrates some precocity and uh, so let's take a look at the race and see how we ran so this is the juvenile sprint and Hedwig is number seven the 
We're off in the Pepsi Juvenile Sprint. Vote No has a good start on the inside. Bledsoe sent it on from the outside to show some early speed. And Go Auto Go. You see how they started. It goes uphill. Hedwig it's is just right a crazy up track. As, well as the field races down the hill. Then comes you see up Hedwig right outside. up on the lead. They break up another two and a half lengths more. Back to the rest of the field as they race down that hill. It is Bledsoe in front. Hedwig is a length back running in second. Then it's Go Auto Go third to the inside. Followed by Vote No. In between horses He's on looking trouble. pretty good there. He's sitting chilly two and in a nice stalking position. No advice. excuses. Dark room is down toward the inside. Eight off the lead. Passed now by Jimmy the Tooth and Baytel Baba Girl is last. They went 21.79 for that opening quarter mile, and they're coming toward the top of the stretch. It is Bledsoe on the inside, Hedwig on the outside. These two turn for home. One, two. Bledsoe on the rail. Right here, this Hedwig should have been his race. I mean, it's just no excuse. By two and a half lengths to the others as they arrive into the final three But as you see, Kentucky Downs, I mean, that stretch just Bledsoe seems to go on and forever. Here, and Hedwig has taken the lead. And now for the back of the pack, vote no and please advise. Trying to make up some late ground. Down on the inside comes Jimmy the Tooth. Here comes vote no. Vote no. Yes. Gets it done in the end yeah, over so Hedwig. Just, uh, just came and up a buck short, but pretty Jimmy good effort for your second career start, especially at Kentucky Downs. So now let's take a look at the invaders from abroad. And the first is Valiant Force, and he will be in the uh, British Cup uh, race because he did win the Norfolk Stakes, and that was a BC Challenge event, so he is in. And uh, he's trained by Adrian Murray. I don't know a whole lot about him. Kevin Stott is the jockey. Uh, he has only raced on straightaways, as, as are the, is the case with many of the Europeans. But... Uh, as you'll see in the Norfolk, it was a pretty impressive effort. The problem for me is that his next effort uh, in Deauville, uh, I, the name of the race escapes me right now, but uh, he finished uh, a pretty dull fifth and uh, really never made any uh, any headway towards the leaders. And it, it was a pretty good field uh, for sure, but he really was a non-factor in it. And you just have to wonder that maybe he was geared up for Ascot, and then that was a big letdown. So, uh, of course, they could do the same thing, uh, moving him uh, to the Breeders' Cup, and, and I think he's had a little time off uh, to readjust, but uh, just something to note. So let's take a look at the Norfolk, and you can see how he got in. Now let's take a look at the Norfolk, and uh, this is one of the early events at Royal Ascot, uh, and I did get to watch this one live. Uh, uh, Valiant Force is in the purple with a white cap with stars around it. And this is a big field. You'll see them split off. And um, I'll try to give you an idea. And incidentally, he won this race at 150 to 1. So to give you an idea of the magnitude of it. Let's see how they did here. And you see Valiant Force is off on the right side. Uh, and uh, pretty keen early on. And you see it is, of course, a straightaway. But this was a pretty good field. Uh, American Rascal is all the way to the far right there. Um, and there were a couple others in here of note. So this was a uh, this was a pretty good field. In particular, uh, Elite Status was one that they were crowing about quite a bit. Uh, and it's just off of uh, Valiant Force there, who's on the left-handed group. And he's off towards the... Uh, He's on the uh, towards the middle there, and you see with his stable mate going one two. You see, elite status was really well thought of. They were thinking this one was a lock to win this, and wasn't the case. Uh, you see, Valiant Force is bad plenty. Inquisitively is from Great Britain, and uh, he, uh, he's he got William Buick as his jockey, and we'll just have to see. Uh, well, Buick's usually in pretty good demand, but if he stays aboard this one, I think that's a pretty good sign. Uh, he just won the uh, Cornwallis Stakes uh, over this last weekend. So, uh, coming, in, uh, coming in in good form. So, let's take a look at that race and see how he did it. 
three days. It has brightened up considerably. They're off, and away they go. Midnight Affair was rather and another slow. straight the away, as you can see, inquisitively is number three well there, right either. off to the lead. Inquisitively showing his speed on the far side of Alabama, a majestic beauty in the purple-white cap near-sized son of Corbalis. They're followed then by Mia Harris in a bright yellow jacket, tears of a clown racing up keenly down the near side of Alaskan Gulf. Floor of Bermuda now in the noseband is improving. Then Rosario, Asian further back, sweetest off the pace with Midnight Looking Affair. Looking pretty good right there. I'll break my heart. Inquisitively being pressed by Alabama towards the far side. Majestic beauty is third. Then Flora of Bermuda now making ground into fourth place from Son of Corbalis and running on far side is Mia Harris as they run towards the final furlong. Inquisitively is quick and up well and goes two lengths that clear. That was pretty Alabama. impressive here that he had some, uh, some late runners flying at him. He, had, he was able to hold him right Rosario, off. Uh, Rosario, pretty good order. And inquisitively wins from Rosario. Then unbreak my heart and Mia Harris. You see that final quarter in uh, a little over 12. That's uh, the final well, fraction. That's pretty good. So, uh, don't know about the class level the in this race, but it was at Newmarket, and that's a premier meet. So, uh, I consider that a pretty good win. Next two Europeans we're going to talk about both come out of the Middle Park Stakes. And the first is Give Me the Beat Boys, and they were really uh, talking this one up at Royal Ascot as one that uh, had a potential to uh, to win the Queen Mary and or the Norfolk. I forget which one he was in, but he was definitely on the tip of a lot of people's tongues. Uh, Jessica Harrington, known as a very good trainer, uh, so uh, he's one to be taken seriously. And that Middle Park Stakes was a really uh, star-studded field, and he ran a pretty good race. We'll take a look at it in a second. second one is Starlust, and I uh, don't know too much about Ralph Beckett, but I have heard his name uh, mentioned before. And uh, this one has had seven starts, which I believe is the most of anyone. And you see that he's been in the money five out of the seven. So we definitely want to take him seriously. So let's take a look at that Middle Park Stakes and see how they did. So this is the Middle Park Stakes uh, from, I believe it was from Newmarket. And that is a premier meet. So we always want to keep that in mind. Uh, the, th this is a smaller field than usual for a sprint and it's on a straightaway uh the two principles we want to think about are give me the beat boys i believe he's in the blue and white and starlust is in uh kind of a light pink and green and they're both right in the middle and i'll point them out to you as we go here and there they are both of them uh right in the middle you see give me the beat boys in that uh what looks to be like dark green and white stripe i guess and then right next to him is starlust with the uh uh, the green and uh, I think that's pink cap, and uh, they're racing right next to each other. Now this is a pretty good field. You had River Tiber in the Mike Tabor silks to the right there, Van Deek, who's an undefeated towards the rear. Uh, so those, these were no slouches. This was a uh, this was a really solid field, and I think it's one we definitely have to uh, take seriously given the level of talent that was in the race. So you see, give me the beat boys and, and Starlust are right up the middle there, and they're, they're both running uh, running pretty big races, I think. And you see, Van Deek is the yellow and black. There he goes, and it's pretty much over at this point, and everybody's running for second, and that'll turn out to be River Tiber. But of the two of our, the ones we're looking at, I think Give Me the Beat Boys probably, you can see, probably ran a little bit better race. But uh, nonetheless, I think they, uh, they both, in, in that kind of a class field, a pretty good effort. Next one we'll talk about is our Canadian import. That's Pippet. And he is tra uh, trained by Kevin Attard, who's a very fine trainer in Canada. And uh, Kinsushi Kimura is a really nice jockey there, too. So these are good connections. And you always got to love a horse who breaks his maiden in a stakes race. And he did that in the Victoria Stakes. Uh, three starts and has never been out of the money. And uh, the most recent effort was in the Algonquin Stakes. So let's take a look at that. This is the Algonquin Stakes of Woodbine. And uh, Pippet is in number four, the number four hole. So let's take a look at that one. See how he did. Race in the Algonquin back to last large hill and going to the front quickly in the center. An okay break. Shot out of the 
It's going to raise a little bit from mid-pack. Sharply Sugar Tree, Golden Canary on the outer and Split Strikes going through it nicely into fourth. On the rails is Pivot, Lodge Hill back second last. And the tail of the field is Dancing Duchess. And racing out in front on the outside is Rock to Fame. Narrowly wraps it in the inside. Right you got a pretty snug hold on him. He's a little keen, but two-year-olds will be that way. And you see, it was kind of a pedestrian quarter for a turf sprint, uh, 22 and 2. Usually, uh, they're breaking the 22 barrier, but you uh, can get to the top of the stretch. And he's right there. Gets, uh, Pippen's going to... Uh, Keep on pretty well, but I thought he was a little slow to engage here. He waits a little, little too long, I thought. But uh, he did kick it in and showed some pretty good pluck. Wasn't quite good enough, but uh, showed a decent effort. I kind of had to look to me a little bit like one that maybe wanted more ground, just a hair, just a little something, and I thought it was a little slow for a. Uh, for a turf sprint, so we do have to wonder about the class level. Next is an Irish import, Mansa Musa. Uh, he's owned by Team Valor International. Some of you remember, may remember Animal Kingdom they owned, who won the Kentucky Derby. And uh, this is a uh, this is an outfit that breeds for turf, and uh, you see him in the states quite often, as well inter internationally, and. Uh, uh, Mansa Musa just uh, just had a recent second in the Blenheim Stakes, so let's take a look. So this is the Ferry House Stakes, and it's uh, uh, running Ferry House, and it's not a track I'm very familiar with. I don't think I've ever heard of it before, but uh, small fields, you'll see. Racing for the and let's see what happens here. Contest over six and towards the far side. The Gary is away pretty smartly. Manza Musa towards the inside. He's going to go forward though. Manza Musa with the Gary just up on the outside for company. Right behind him is Leah Fail, verified races in company with Rush Queen. Just 14 for the first furlong. Pretty slow. Down along the side of the track they go. Manza Musa favorite leads and is a shade keen. Being chased in second by McGarry, and just in behind them towards the inside is Leah Fail, verified as a little wider out, wide of Rush Queen, with down the inner matter of fact, and just behind them is Edwardian. Into the bend they come, and making the way on towards the three, and Manza Musa, Chris Hayes, leads from McGarry in second for Gary Carroll, verified up on the outside, Marvel Potter, and this trio on track by Leah Fail, trying to get out the inside as matter of fact. And there was something down. unique in this race, there was a turn. Manza, just behind them, so. McGarry is ridden. Failed the far side, verified as written. Rush Queen tracks the leader, Manza Musa, as they race now well, well inside the two. Manza Musa with the advantage. Far side, Leah Fail. Near side, McGarry. Rush Queen is just behind them, and Manza Musa holds the advantage. McGarry now swings through on the near side and takes it over. McGarry leads Ms. Manza Musa from the far side, and it's McGarry who's going to lengthen away on a good afternoon for Gavin Cromwell. It is another one in McGarry who wins from in second. Is Manza Musa in third? Is Leah Fail fourth to Rush Queen? Five, matter of fact, six verified, seven Edwardian. So we got a decent second, I guess, but uh, that's an awful slow time for six furlongs. Only six, one, uh, 116. So I don't know how seriously we want to take this race. Big Evs is a uh, British import, and he's trained by Michael Appleby, not Charlie. And uh, this one is. Uh, you know, he's been in the money four out of five times, and uh, there's been a lot of talk about this one, and I think you're going to see why when we take a look at the Flying Childers Stakes next. So this is the Flying Childers Stakes, and uh, it's not going to be hard to find Big Evs. There he goes right away, sharp as attack, right out to the lead. Now, the only thing I will say is we do have to keep in mind this is a straightaway. And so, he obviously shot. has a lot of very speed. raw speed, but it's straightaway speed. So we don't know exactly nice if that will translate well, to a turn or not. But, uh, boy, he's pretty impressive. I mean, when they get to the lead like that, and it just, there's no doubt from start to finish, you certainly have to take him consideration. Look at him go. I mean, they're, just, they're all playing for second. Nobody's got a shot. I don't know how good the quality of this field was, but does it really matter when you run like this? Because there's just never a doubt. Stunning all the way in for Big Evs, electric. He wins the Flying Childers in brilliant style. Flora of Bermuda second, 
And it's very Pretty tight awesome. indeed for third with Malk and Rosario amongst the well beaten. The last one we'll talk about is Tiger Bell, and he's uh, an Irish import. Uh, and uh, you can see he's been in the money four out of five times, like a, like a few of these. So I uh, think we have to take him seriously. Unfortunately, uh, as it is often the case with French racing, I was not able to find a replay of the Prix de Arenberg. However, uh, you it's a uh, uh, this this one looks significant, and uh, the the note I uh, I read about was uh, great gate speed. So uh, as we know in turf sprints, uh, that's very important. So. Uh, we'll just have to see if this one comes over, uh, how he does it uh, at Santa Anita and training-wise, and then maybe we can reevaluate. But uh, right now, he's just a mystery and a rather intriguing one. Okay, so that's a lot of material to be sure. But from uh, from the race replays and uh, just looking over the field of uh, the potential field of what it is, these are the top prospects. I haven't necessarily ranked them in any order, but... Uh, of the ones, I, I loved, really liked what I saw from Shards. Uh, I thought I uh, displayed a really big late turn of foot. And that was a big step up in class. So I think a logical progression is uh, in the offing. And given uh, given the amount of European imports we're going to have here, uh, I think you might have a price. Uh, Dark Vintage, another one I thought uh, was a little bit of a ground-saving uh, advantage that uh, that he had. Um, in the speakeasy, but um, did keep on well, and Slider looked like the class of the field. Uh, so to, to keep up with Slider and, and stay in the running when they left basically everybody in the dust, I think, uh, shows some talent. And perhaps with another move uh, forward, then uh, could be a really serious competitor, especially since it's at Santa Anita. No Name Mets is pretty logical. Uh, it's shown a lot of talent. Uh, the fact that uh, they even sent him over to uh, to Ascot, I think, says a lot about him. And George Weaver in turf sprints is awful dangerous nowadays. Give me the beat, boys. Uh, did well at Ascot. And um, in that last race that we saw uh, with the uh, Middle Park, I thought ran a really big race. And uh, that was a very talented field. So uh, I, I think that, that gives an idea of the quality and um, I think this is one we really got to take seriously uh, moving in if he comes over. Big Evs, I mean, what can you say? That was just outstanding watching that horse run just uh, tons of raw speed. But the only thing we got to wonder about is can he do it around a turn? And can he do it if perhaps his post is compromising or some other issue? And then the other issue is, of course, the firmer ground that you're going to get in California. But uh, just to, from a a natural ta talent perspective is one you absolutely have to consider. And then we're going to throw Tiger Bell in there just because we don't really know much about her. It's a her, by the way, I found out. Sorry about that. Um, but um, three, uh, four out of five in the money. And um, I got enough to be very interested and intrigued. So we'll just have to see uh, if she comes over, how she does when uh, she gets to San Anita. Well, that's a lot of material, I know, but this is meant to be a reference guide for you. You'll have all the race replays, the significant ones available to you uh, with, uh, with some evaluation, and uh, hopefully this will provide you uh, with a good study material, if you will, uh, for the Breeders' Cup. And we're going to do this for every race, uh, for all the divisions, uh, so be on the lookout for those postings as they uh, will be uh, continuing them all the way up to the Breeders' Cup. And then, of course, we'll have some final wrap-up and a maybe a little strategy session to talk about how we might want to bet it. Uh, the Breeders' Cup is a very unique event, to be sure, over two days. And uh, there's a lot of great opportunities. So I can't wait to get into it, and I'm sure you can't either. So hopefully this will be a nice help for you, and uh, I hope you liked it. And if you do like other videos like this that we post, please like and subscribe. And we do thank you for coming by. Um, stay on the lookout for more about the Breeders' Cup, and I'll talk to you soon. And until then, be well.